Today on Legalese, we are going to be doing a Supreme Court end of session roundup. Now, they have recently handed down two very important decisions from the fall 2021 term uh, that dealt with important issues regarding criminal justice reform. And the results of these cases have been, well, disappointing to say the least. So we are going to be going through both cases. I will be touching on the important information that you need to know to understand what these cases were about and what the significance of the court's opinions will likely mean moving forward. Hey, greetings and welcome back to Legalese. Uh, my name is Bob. I am your host. Thank you so much for joining me here today. And if you are new to the program, I would especially like to welcome you. Uh, this is a podcast where we mostly uh, discuss current events in law, politics, and culture. So now today we are going to be doing the first of at least two and probably three videos that I'm going to be calling the Supreme Court Roundup, where we're going to be covering all the decisions for the court's fall 2021 term that is scheduled to come to an end uh, on July 2nd if they get all the cases out by them. It's looking like this is the first year that that's not going to happen, which is uh, telling in itself. But anyways, we are going to be talking about uh, how the cases that have come out, uh, well, today at least, we're going to be talking about how the cases that have been coming out uh, dealing with criminal justice reform have really been uh, a supreme disappointment. Uh, and while we have yet to get our hands on the decision in cases such as Jackson's Whole Women's Health versus Dobbs, uh, which is the opinion that will be the most important uh, opinion addressing abortion since 1992's Planned Parenthood v. Casey, what we do have are two opinions that are a real abortion of criminal justice laws. Now, these are Shin v. Ramirez and Egbert v. Boole. So I will be going over both of these opinions and breaking down and giving you guys a good understanding of the court's primary holdings, the issues in the case, and the effect that you can expect these cases to have in relevant future criminal justice reform issues. So the first case we'll be looking at is Shin v. Ramirez. Now, this case was handed down on May 23rd. And at issue in the case, is this case concerned the scope of evidence that a federal appellate court can consider when reviewing a petition for habeas relief. Now, the question presented to the court was, does application of the equitable rule this court announced in Martinez v. Ryan render 28 U.S.C. section 2254 subsection E2 inapplicable to a federal court's merit review for a claim for habeas relief. Now, that particular section of law I just quoted uh, right here says, If the appellant has failed to develop the factual basis of a claim in state court proceedings, the court shall not hold an evidentiary hearing on the claim unless the applicant shows that a factual predicate that could not have been previously discovered through the exercise of due diligence. Now, right now, that probably makes no sense, but I promise you as we go through this, uh, everything will come together. You will have a good understanding of what this means by the time we're done discussing it. So this is a summary of the important background information in the case. So we had uh, two respondents, uh, a David Martinez Ramirez and Barry Lee Jones, who were each convicted of capital crimes in Arizona State Court and both sentenced to death. Now, the Arizona Supreme Court affirmed each case on direct review and each prisoner was denied state post-conviction relief. Each also filed for federal habeas relief under 28 U.S.C. Section 2254, arguing that the trial's counsel had been ineffective for failing to conduct an adequate investigation. Now, the federal district court held in each case that the prisoner's ineffective assistance to counsel was 
procedurally defaulted because it was not properly presented in state court. To overcome a procedural default, in such cases, a prisoner must demonstrate cause to excuse the procedural defect and actual prejudice. And to demonstrate cause, Ramirez and Jones relied on the decision in Martinez v. Ryan, which held that ineffective assistance of post-conviction counsel may be cited as cause for the procedural default of an ineffective assistance of trial counsel claim. Now, in Ramirez's case, the district court permitted him to supplement the record with evidence not presented in state court to support his case to excuse the procedural default. And assessing the new evidence, the court excused the procedural default but rejected Ramirez's ineffective assistance claim on the merits. Now, the Ninth Circuit reversed the remand for more evidentiary development to litigate the merits of Ramirez's ineffective assistance of trial counsel claim. And then in the Jones case, the district court held that a lengthy evidentiary hearing on cause and prejudice forgave his procedural default and held that the state trial counsel had provided ineffective assistance. Now, the state of Arizona petitioned the court in both cases, arguing that Section 2254, subsection E2, does not permit a federal court to order evidentiary development simply because post-conviction counsel is alleged to have negligently failed to develop the state court record. And the court's primary holding in the case was that under 28 U.S.C. 2254, a federal habeas court may not conduct an evidentiary hearing on or otherwise consider evidence beyond the state court record on the ineffective assistance of state post-conviction counsel. And the final judgment uh, is the court reversed the Ninth Circuit's decision by 6 to 3, uh, in an opinion written by Justice Thomas with Justice Sotomayor, filing a dissenting opinion, joined by Breyer and Kagan. So, the majority opinion was written by Thomas, and he was joined by Chief Justice Roberts and Justices Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. And the opinion of the court states that a federal habeas court generally may consider a state prisoner's federal claim only if he has first presented that claim to the state court in accordance with state procedure. When the prisoner has failed to do so, and the state court would dismiss the claim on that basis, the claim is procedurally defaulted. And to overcome a procedural default, the prisoner must demonstrate cause to excuse this procedural defect and actual prejudice if the federal court were to decline to hear his claim. Now, this is based on the uh, precedent set in a case known as Coleman v. Thompson. And again, this case relied also on Martinez v. Ryan, which was a 2012 case. And the court explained that according to Martinez v. Ryan, this court... Uh, that the ineffective assistance of post-conviction counsel is cause to forgive a procedural default of an ineffective assistance of trial counsel claim, but only if the state required the prisoner to raise that claim for the first time during the uh, state's post-conviction proceeding. And... For the dissent, it was written by Justice Sotomayor. She was joined by Justices Breyer and Kagan. And she said, The Sixth Amendment guarantees criminal defendants the right to the effective assistance of counsel at trial. The court has recognized that right as a bedrock principle that constitutes the very foundation for our adversarial system of criminal justice. In citing Martinez versus Ryan, she says, today, however, 
The court hamstrings the federal court's authority to safeguard that right. The court's decision will leave many people who were convicted in violation of the Sixth Amendment to face incarceration or even execution without any meaningful chance to vindicate their right to counsel. And for my analysis on this, and I will admit at this point, this is where my own opinion and personal bias comes into it. So everything you just heard was the straight facts of the case. This is my opinion, so take that for whatever it's worth. But so when it comes to Shin v. Ramirez, essentially the court held that a death row inmate who received ineffective state-appointed counsel at both trial and post-conviction state court proceedings is now barred from presenting new exculpatory evidence, even if it's evidence of actual innocence in a federal court. Essentially, what the court decided is that innocence isn't enough. That is what was declared by the state attorneys during oral arguments. They actually said that innocence isn't enough. Insisting that the federal courts must defer to the flawed state proceedings. Now, later in her opinion, uh, Sotomayor wrote in the, or in the dissent, she wrote that this decision is perverse and it is illogical, and on that, she is right on both counts. Now, every court should consider the actual merits of a death row inmate. So, Barry Jones' innocence claim had ruled that he never should have been convicted of murder. And every court to rule against Jones did so for procedural reasons without considering this new evidence of actual innocence. Now, if Jones is executed, it will not be because there is an overwhelming evidence of his guilt. It will be because of a technicality. Now, the Sixth Amendment guarantees the right to effective counsel in criminal cases. And Jones had ineffective state-appointed counsel during both trial and post-conviction. And now, as his new effective counsel has turned up evidence of his potential innocence, evidence that earlier ineffective lawyers failed to find, the Supreme Court has barred him from presenting such exculpatory evidence in federal court. So, really, so much for the Sixth Amendment. All right, next we are moving on to Egbert v. Boole. Now, the main issue of this case... uh concerns the U.S. Supreme Court's ruling in a case known as Bivens v. Six Unknown Federal Narcotics Agent from 1971. Now, in a Bivens claim, private individuals may sue FBI agents for violating their Fourth, Fifth, or Eighth Amendment rights. Now, as far as the question presented to the court for review... The original petition for cert contained three review questions. First, whether a cause of action exists under Bivens for First Amendment retaliation claims. Second, whether a cause of action exists under Bivens for claims against a federal officer engaged in immigration-related functions for allegedly violating a plaintiff's Fourth Amendment rights. And third, whether the court should reconsider Bivens. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court, when uh, it granted cert on this case, only granted limited review on the first two questions. So, to give you a summary of this case here, uh, essentially, respondent Robert Bull owned a bed and breakfast known as the Smuggler's Inn, and this was in the town of Blaine, Washington. Now, this inn apparently abuts the international border between the United States and Canada. Now, Boole, at times, has helped federal agents identify and apprehend persons engaged in unlawful cross-border activity on or near his property. But Boole would also provide transportation and lodging to illegal border crossers. Often, Boole would agree to help the illegal border crossers 
enter or exit the United States only to later call federal agents to report the unlawful activity. Now in 2014, Bull informed the petitioner, Eric Egbert, a U.S. Border Patrol agent, that a Turkish national would be arriving in Seattle by way of New York, that he had scheduled transportation to the smugglers in. Now, when Agent Eckbird uh, observed one of Bull's vehicles returning to the inn, he suspected that the Turkish national was a passenger and followed the vehicle to the inn. Now, on Bull's account, Bull asked Egbert to leave, but Egbert refused. He became violent and threw Bull first against the vehicle and then to the ground. Egbert then checked the immigration paperwork for Bull's guest and left after finding everything was in fact in order. Now, the Turkish guest that we, he was reporting unlawfully entered Canada later that evening. So, Bull filed a grievance with Agent Egbert's supervisors and an administrative claim with Border Patrol pursuant to the Federal Tort Claims Act. Egbert allegedly retaliated against Bull by reporting Bull's uh, smuggler license plate. That's the license plate that was on his car. It's S M U G L E R. He reported Bull's smuggler license plate to the Washington Department of Licensing for referencing illegal activity and by contacting the Internal Revenue Service and prompting an audit of Bull's tax returns. So, Bull's claims under the Federal Torch Claim Act claimed uh, was, alleged, was ultimately denied, and the Border Patrol took no action against Egbert for his use of force and his alleged acts of retaliation. So, Bull then sued Egbert in federal district court, alleging a Fourth Amendment violation for excessive use of force and a First Amendment violation for unlawful retaliation. And in this, he evoked the uh, precedent set by Bivens versus six unknown federal narcotics agents, and Bull asked the district court to recognize a damage action for each alleged constitutional violation. Now, the district court declined to extend Bivens as requested, but the Court of Appeals reversed. And in the Supreme Court, the holding was that Bivens does not extend to create a cause of action for Bull's Fourth Amendment excessive force claim and a First Amendment retaliation claim. And the judgment goes on to say that in Bivens, the court held that it had the authority to create a damages action against federal agents for violating the plaintiff's Fourth Amendment rights. The analysis of a proposed Bivens claims proceeds in two steps. A court asks first whether a case presents a new Bivens context, i.e., is it meaningfully different from the three cases in which the court has implied a damages action? And the other case that is important to this is a case known as Ziegler v. Abbasi. Uh, and second, even if so, do special factors indicate that the judiciary is at least arguably less equipped than Congress to weigh the costs and benefits of allowing a damages action to proceed. Now, this two-step inquiry often resolves to a single federal question, and that is whether there is any reason to think that the court might be better equipped to create a damages remedy. So further, under the court's precedent, a court may not fashion a Bivens remedy if Congress has already provided or has authorized the executive to provide an alternative remedial structure under Ziegler v. Abbasi. Now, the Court of Appeals conceded that Boole's Fourth Amendment claim presented a new Bivens context, but its conclusion was that there was no reason to hesitate before recognizing a cause of action against Agent Egbert, but this was incorrect, the court says, for two independent reasons. First was the, quote, risk of undermining border security, which provides reason to hesitate before extending Bivens into this field, end quote. 
And in another Bivens case known as Hernandez, the court declined to create a damages remedy for an excessive force claim against a Border Patrol agent because, quote, regulating the conduct of agents at the border unquestionably has national security implications, end quote. And that reasoning, the court said, applied with full force here. Now, second, Congress has also provided alternative remedies for aggrieved parties in Bull's position that independently foreclose a Bivens action here. By regulation, Border Patrol must investigate all alleged violations and accept grievances from any person uh, under the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, Title VIII, uh, Sections 287.10, Subsections A through B. Bull claims that this regulatory grievance procedure is inadequate. But the court has never held that a Bivens alternative must afford rights such as judicial review of an adverse determination. Now, Bivens is concerned solely with deterring the unconstitutional acts of individual officers. And, regardless, the question whether a given remedy is adequate is a legislative determination, as in Hernandez. Now, the court has no warrant to doubt, they say, that the consideration of Boole's grievances secure adequate deterrence and afford Boole an alternative remedy. So, essentially and ultimately, there is no Bivens cause of action for Boole's First Amendment retaliation claim. And this claim also, uh, and this is much more clearly defined than the other one, but this obviously would present a new Bivens context. And there are many reasons to think that Congress is better suited to authorize a damage remedy. Now, extending Bivens to alleged First Amendment violations would pose an acute risk that fear of personal monetary liability and harassing litigation will unduly inhibit officials in the discharge of their duties. And in light of these costs, Congress is in a better position to decide whether or not the public interest would be served by imposing a damages action. Now, in this case as well, Justice Thomas wrote the majority opinion for the court, and this is another 6-3 case uh, along, uh, I guess you could say, ideological lines. So it was Thomas, joined by Chief Justice Roberts, and Justices uh, Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. Now, in Justices, or excuse me, in Justice Thomas's opinion to the court, he said in Bivens versus six unknown federal narcotics agent from 1971, this court authorized a damages action against federal officials that alleged violations of the Fourth Amendment. Over the past 42 years, however, we have declined 11 times to imply a similar cause of action for other alleged constitutional violations. Nevertheless, the Court of Appeals permitted not one, but two constitutional damages actions to proceed against a U.S. Border Patrol agent, a Fourth Amendment excessive force claim, and a First Amendment retaliation claim. Because our cases have made clear that, in all but the most unusual circumstances prescribing a cause of action is a job for Congress and not the courts, we reverse. And again, we have a dissent written by Justice Sotomayor and joined by Justices Breyer and Kagan. And what Justice Sotomayor said was, Respondent Robert Poole alleges that the petitioner, Eric Egbert, a U.S. Customs and Border Patrol agent, violated the Fourth Amendment by entering Boole's property without a warrant and assaulting him. Existing precedent permits Boole to seek compensation for his injuries in a federal court under the Bivens v. Six Unknown Narcotics Agents and under Ziegler v. Abbasi. Now the court goes to extraordinary lengths, she says, to avoid this result, referring to the majority opinion. She says it rewrites a legal standard it established just five years ago, that's the one established in Ziegler v. Abbasi, and it, stretches, it stresses national security concerns beyond recognition. 
and discerns an alternative remedial structure where none exists. The court's innovations, taken together, enable it to close the door to Boole's claim and presumably to others that fall squarely within the Pippin's ambit. And she went on to point out that today's decision does not strictly overrule Bivens, but it nevertheless contravenes precedent and will strip many more individuals who suffer injuries at the hands of other federal officers and whose circumstances are materially indistinguishable from those in Bivens of this important remedy. And she writes, I therefore dissent from the court's disposition in Boole's Fourth Amendment claims. However, she did concur in part. She said that I concur in the court's judgment that Boole's First Amendment retaliation claim may not proceed under Bivens, but for reasons grounded in precedent rather than the court's newly announced test. All right, and now we are getting to another place where I want to kind of sum up the case and uh, explain in, in more plain English what this means moving forward. And this is going from just reading the opinion of the court to giving you something that is at least partially based on my own opinion here. So just, I, I just like pointing that out every time it happens. So anyways, personally, I have to admit something, and that is that my view on the propriety of this case has actually shifted somewhat since I initially, initially read the case brief. Now, I do still disagree with Justice Thomas's majority opinion, but I don't disagree nearly as vehemently as I did. And upon a second read of Sotomayor's dissent, I realized that it was more hollow than my first impression made clear. Now, this is because so much of her opinion is uh, chalked up to criticizing the court for departing from Ziegler, but it's done so in a very... Uh, personal and not professional and certainly not legal fashion. So, if the legal standard the court articulates to reject Boole's Fourth Amendment claims sounds unfamiliar, she said, that's because it is. Just five years after circumscribing the standard for allowing Bivens claims to proceed, she goes on to say a, quote, Restless and newly constituted court sees fit to refashion the standard anew to foreclose remedies in yet more cases. Now, there are two separate barbs there. First, she is charging that the reason why the Ziegler standard was refashioned was this newly constituted court. That is, she is saying that it was Justice Kavanaugh and Barrett replacing Kennedy and Ginsburg. Now, this claim very much brings to mind uh, another claim that I have a big problem with, and that was Justice Stevens' dissent in Citizens United, when he said, quote, In the end, the court's rejection of Austin and McConnell come down to nothing more than its disagreement with their results. Virtually every one of its arguments was made and rejected in those cases, and the majority opinion is essentially an amalgamation of resuscitated dissents. The only relevant thing that has changed since Austin and McConnell is the composition of this court. And second, Sotomayor charged that her new colleagues were, quote, young and restless. So still, this personalized rhetoric from Justice Sotomayor, especially at this time, I believe is actually quite misplaced. The fact is, Bivens has been subject to withering criticism for decades. And the fact is that the Hernandez case, which was another precedent that was talked about earlier, uh, sent a very, very clear message that the court should really, really be cautious about the application of a Bivens claim. And yet, the Ninth Circuit seemed to not get that memo and moved ahead without any kind of due caution. Now, the Supreme Court was compelled to say, we really, really mean it. In language that not even, I would say, the ghost of Stephen Reinhardt could ignore. This is not the court being restless. This is the court falling back on its own precedent. 
So initially, the problem that, as I saw it, was his rejection of the precedent precedent set in Bivens. But again, it, it, for me, uh, as I've looked back on the case and studied it more, it, that is the Bivens case. I've gone back now and studied the Bivens case more closely in its own right, as opposed to analyzing it under the doctrine of stare decisis, particularly uh, re- in regard to its application in this particular case. And I've actually come to realize that uh, Justice Thomas was right. Bivens was an example of the stereotypical war in court judicial activism in criminal justice reform, and that denying this case created a federal cause of action was actually the right call. So, if Thomas made the right call, why do I still have a problem with his decision, you might be asking? Well, the court had recognized a cause of action under the Fourth Amendment against federal law enforcement agents in 1971 in Bivens, and it extended it into subsequent cases, but it has rejected further Bivens claims in every Supreme Court Bivens case in my lifetime, except for this one. And that does not seem likely to change. And we had uh, two justices, Thomas and Gorsuch, who have called for Bivens to be overruled for the reason I just named, because it lacks a formal or historical basis. And Justices Thomas and Gorsuch are right about the lack of a formal historical basis. But I still worry about the broader picture. Now, as Justice Thomas's concurrence notes, it's not like there was no, excuse me, Justice Gorsuch's concurrence notes. It's not like there was no remedy for unconstitutional conduct before Bivens. Rather, he writes, From the ratification of the Bill of Rights until 1971, the court did not create an implied private action for damages against federal officers alleged to have violated a citizen's constitutional rights. Suits to recover damages were generally brought under state law. Now, what Justice Thomas does not note is that it has become very difficult to bring those suits under state law as well. There is some debate about whether that difficulty is attributable to Congress's 1984 enactment of what is known as the Westfall Act. Now, various judicial decisions arguably misconstruing that act uh, point leave the point one that I think we are entitled to wonder about. And essentially the problem is this. If the court is going to abolish the 20th century remedies for unconstitutional conduct, it should at least give us back our 19th century remedies. So as previously mentioned, in Thomas's majority opinion, we find amongst his dicta a passage suggesting Bivens is fundamentally a bad ruling and should be overruled. Now, he could not take things that far as the case had that third and final question in the main question presented stricken uh, from the court's review. If you remember, they asked three questions. The court only accepted two. The third question was, uh, should we reevaluate the Bivens claim? So, while this court was unable to properly and directly address that, if we go back to a case from 2020, Hernandez v. Mesa, we will see that while normally the court would lack the ability to take a big picture view in these cases, since it can only speak to the question presented before it, in Hernandez, the petitioner foresaw this problem and petitioned the Supreme Court to consider that second part of the question. It said if there is no Bivens liability, then they asked, whether the Westfall Act violates the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment insofar as it preempts state law tort suits for damages against rogue federal agents. Uh, 
acting within the scope of their employment for which there is no alternative legal remedy. So really, Hernandez is the rare case in which the court could have considered both questions at the same time and thus provided an account for what violations of constitutional violations actually remain. And it does seem perverse to think that Congress can eliminate state law damages for constitutional violations without either Congress or the courts providing any kind of alternative. Now, it's possible that this seemingly perverse result is constitutional, especially if one takes a very broad view of federal power. But to me, it still seems troubling for the court to repeatedly narrow Bivens without the least consideration of that question. All right, and that is going to do it for us here today. Uh, I want to thank you all so much for joining me here. Uh, now, we'll probably have more cases coming up this week. Uh, we, uh, we're still accepting, expecting some very big ones. We're expecting the uh, Jackson abortion case, the Bruin uh, Second Amendment case. And actually, I've got a video about the Bruin case, even though the decision hasn't come, in, come down yet. Uh, I have a, a video addressing some relevant issues to the case that I've written, and I'm going to try and get out later tonight or hopefully tomorrow because I need to get it out before the case comes out. So be looking out for that. And if you want to make sure that you see those videos when they come out, just take a second, please, real quick, and subscribe to the channel. Make sure to click that little bell that tells you when new videos come out. And then I, I, if you like the video, you know, go ahead and hit that little thumbs up button down there. Uh, if you dislike the video, uh, you're free to hit that little thumbsy downy button too, I guess, if you want to be a jerk. Um, and please leave me a comment. I always really do uh, love the chance to hear from you guys and get your thoughts on the videos and the topics discussed uh, and to uh, even interact with you a little bit as, as much as I'm able to uh, talking about this stuff. So uh, yeah, let me know what you thought. And uh, yeah, that's really all I've got. I, I will be back very soon. With some more videos, we will be uh, staying right on top of these court cases as they come out. So uh, until next time, this has been me, Bob, for Legalese, uh, talking about criminal justice reform. And of course, as always, Cartago de Lenda Est.